The Gary Vee brand is optimism based in practicality, kindness and happiness on pure and utter audacious offense. I'm an immigrant, I wasn't born here. My, my dad and mom are my heroes. My mom raised me impeccably. Um, she instilled obnoxious self-esteem in me, which makes me super confident, but I come from zero place. So I think I'm balancing that ego versus the humbleness of being an immigrant. Uh, my dad taught me great things, including that, yeah. which is the biggest thing that saved me because as a storyteller, you know, as a marketer, there's that bullshit in me and my dad was able to suck a lot of that out yeah. to give me the right balance. What, um, what is that? Is that the, like, my, my word is my bond? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So like I fight fiercely for having a good legacy. Well, I like that because I think that's how most of small business is still done these days. Absolutely. It's, it's done by relationship, it's done by, you know, handshakes and all big that. Big business too. They just don't talk about it as much, right? The mergers, the acquisitions, the big boy stuff, yep. the big girl stuff. That happens with relationship too. Yeah, you're right. You know, I was flying down here, ironically, with a gentleman who was telling me about stuff he's done with the government. Guy was like 70, 80 years old and telling me amazing stuff. And just, you know, it's, it's, he said, it's all about relationship. I said, you're talking to the right kid. Yeah. You know, he's trying to preach it. I'm like, boy, am I sold. Yeah. I'm like, I'm a 90-year-old man in a 35-year-old body. And he started laughing. We talked. Um, Absolutely, I got here because my dad built the American dream for me. You know, he built a small family business, uh, a liquor store business. I was whisked into it when I was 14. I have enormous entrepreneurial chops. I'm natural, right? Yeah. I'm like an athlete. What kind of sales was your family doing at that time? We were a three to four million dollar business at the okay. time I got involved full time. Just wine? Just wine, liquor, and beer. Okay. Shoppers discount liquors. Uh, from 98 to 2005 in that seven year window, I grew it to a 45 million dollar year business. Amazing. Um, and so I was very good. I'm good at what I do. Well, people want to know how you did that because that's... I did that traditionally. Direct mail, radio, print, you know, that big advertising. I paid myself $27,000 a year so I could hire good people. Yep. I built infrastructure and systems. I collected data. I, I did everything you have to do. It's never one move. It's not having a Twitter profile or a Facebook fan page. It's not having a LinkedIn profile. It's everything. It's yeah. everything. You've got to do everything. I just left my biggest brand that I've ever built, Wine Library TV, to start Daily Grape because I wanted the challenge of building a subscription model and a mobile play. I'm pointing to my pocket. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just think that um, I got here I got there, I'm going to big places because there's a couple things I understand, which is number one, if you don't evolve, if you don't play within the reality of the marketplace, you'll get run over. I don't give a shit if the tree comes down. I just love the chopping. I can't ever be upset. I love the chopping more than the tree coming down. And I truly believe that is the rawest most authentic trait of an entrepreneur. And that's why when people tell me they're an entrepreneur and I see that they hate the process, I'm like, you're not. Everybody thinks they need to be an entrepreneur right now. It's trendy. And I think it's a far more rare trait and talent than people realize. I'm an enormous fan of looking at entrepreneurship the same way I look at being LeBron James, right? Or, you know. Or Adele, like I can't sing better. Yeah. Like you know, I, I I can't be in the NBA. You know, I could become a much better basketball player than I am right now, but I still can't be in the NBA. I could become a better businessman or woman than I am right now, but it doesn't mean you're going to be one of these great ten, twenty, fifty million dollar business people. Yeah. Um, I think it's a talent, and I'm not unaware or lack the empathy of somebody watching saying, "Oh, easy for you to say you're one of them," but like. It's just what I believe. If you weren't selling something before you were 15, you're not a salesman. There was no option for me. Like I, the first time I saw a flower, I'm like, I'm gonna sell that. I wasn't like, that's pretty. You know, that's DNA. Yeah. What the lack of patience means to me, of most people, is they don't love what they're doing. Yeah. They're not doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. They don't believe in themselves. They don't have the resources or the time. But it's one of those things and that's why so many great things go unnoticed. There's yeah. people who can't eat tonight. Yeah. They're, they hear you say that you're in a struggle, they want to vomit on themselves, <laughs> right? You hear me saying I'm in the struggle, you want to vomit on yourself, right? And so like we all have our struggles, yeah. we all have what we want. I really equally, as somebody who wants to eat, I want to buy the Jets and I know how obnoxious that sounds but it's just the way I feel. 
Everything's hard. Yeah. And look, I have plenty of shortcomings. Plenty of people. Mark Cuban bought his team way quicker than I did. Like, you know, we all have our levels of talent. We all have our moments. We all have these things. What I would say is this. If nothing good happened to me going forward from this moment on, I'd be okay. And I think that's what you need to accept. You need to stay equally hungry and want to achieve things, but you have to learn how to balance that with the contentness of all the great things that are going for you because so many people have it worse. I'm driven by gratitude. I'm equally egotistical as I am loaded with humility. Like, you've, you know, you've got a balance. And I'm just so blown away by people's lack of self-awareness when they're crying about things. Yeah. I mean, you're in the struggle. The fact that you have the ability to be chasing this is incredible. In a world where I've accomplished a lot of great things and I'm in a very happy place, like it makes me want to bring other values to other people, right? And so if I'm giving advice, if I'm putting out content, if I want something good to happen, if I'm so selfish that I want somebody to email me and say I've I've changed their life, I want to give them practical advice. And hustle's the only thing, I can't tell people become more talented. Like you're not, you know, like, hey, become smart. Like, yeah. like smarter was good, that was good advice, but that's not good advice anymore because information's on our hand. Like memorizing information is not good advice anymore. Right. Like what do you want to know? Here it is. Yeah, so like, that's Right? So that's not good. What's, what is controllable? You know, work three hours more a day. Now work three hours more a day if you're sitting at home and complaining, if you're not happy with your life, if you're pumped, if you make a million dollars a year or $50,000 a year, if you see your kids every day, if you never see your kids, if you go to tons of ball games, if you've never watched sports, however you roll, if you're pumped, if you're watching right now and you're pumped, God, uh, mazel tov, like I'm so happy. Yeah, leave yay, it as is. Yay, yeah. if you sit at home right now and you're watching this on a small screen on your laptop and you're not pumped, the one thing that I know everybody can do is watch a little less of House of Cards, is go to the bar a couple less times with their buddies, it's play a couple less games on your, don't play fucking Candy Crush. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse in that. <laughs> but, you know, but yeah. you know, that is why I'm obsessed with hustle because it's the one variable that everybody can control that can change the outcome of their lives. I don't have a gear to complain about my losses. I'm not gonna make content that you know is ha- has me crying. Right. And so I just know that being an entrepreneur means that, I mean right now I'm in the, in the midst of putting together a big deal. In the not executing it properly in the last 12 months, I've lost a million dollars. I'm showing people like my hustle is different than your hustle. Like, I don't have 20 minutes, there is no 10 minutes today that I'm gonna watch a funny YouTube video that my buddy sent me. Yeah. That doesn't exist. And so, I also wanna talk about losing. Like, losing's part of the equation. Every entrepreneur loses some, now for me, I like micro losses. Thank God that losing that kind of money is now a micro loss, I'm not out of business. Yeah. So I'm, I'm taking micro losses to make sure I don't have a macro loss. Because there's a lot of people who will go from 20 to 80 years. I, there are people in my sphere that interact with me on social that I'm 100% sure will never win. <laughs> I'm being dead serious. And yeah. it's a tough thing to say and I don't like to say what I just said, but they will perpetually lose in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then die. Yeah. I fully believe that. Is that lack of talent? It's a lack of self-awareness. Okay. It's not lack of talent. We all have talents. We all have two or three things, four things that we're better at than the other things we're good at. Now your best thing that you're best at, you might actually just be average in the whole world at. But if it's your best thing, it's the thing you need to do because being average is a hell of a lot better than being below average. Right. Got it? Yeah. Self-awareness is the ultimate, the ultimate in our society right now and we're living through a time right now where a lot of kids are being sold to become entrepreneurs when they're not. We're living in a time where people are being told to become famous and extroverts and put out content and they're not. And as somebody who's living that life, I want people to understand like, look, you have to be built for it. In the same way that I wasn't built to be a scholar and even though I grew up in the 80s and 90s when being a good student was the game, I fought against it because I was self-aware. Now we have the reverse. There's so many great students that can go and become amazing consultants, make 500,000 a year, have a beach house, marry attractive people, have a great life, but they're gonna go and become startup founders and spend six years failing, going into depression, not winning. It's a real thing. Yeah. Self-awareness. So your advice is to double down on what you're good at. Quadruple down. Yeah. 
Like uh, doubling's not enough, Brian. Brian, like like all of it. Yeah. Like we just were talking before about you know some services where I'm like I'll pay for anything. Like if you're not good at hanging a picture, have somebody else do it. The biggest mistake I see right now on everyone's hot takes on NFTs is the culture of no and the culture of either or. If you dropped an M and an E, fucking post edit this shit, Team Gary. If you dropped an M and an E at the beginning and the end of that fucking terrible word or and made it more, you would actually live life. The biggest issue in life is that people think it's either or, that their religion is better than someone else's, that their political stance is better than somebody else's, that their product is better than someone else's, that their content is better. Your fucking inability to understand everybody can get theirs, that we can all fucking coexist, that NFTs can dominate while sports cards and comics and toys. I'm going to the fucking National this upcoming week or in two weeks to Chicago and I'm gonna buy a fuckload, and I mean a fuckload of cardboard while I'm also gonna buy NFTs on the blockchain. And very easily in my fucking heart and in my soul and in my brain and in my fucking ethics, essence, sorry, I'm fucking pumped, D-Rock. In my essence, it's very easy for those things to coexist. And the shit that I'm not interested in, watches, sports cards, handbags, antiques from fucking Europe, and the other trillion fucking things, including, stick with me now, the other things I don't give a fuck about investing in, like, stick with me now, real estate. You know how many fucks I give about putting my money in real estate? Zero. Meanwhile, do I understand that some people do well, almost everybody, that's an icon in real estate and buy sports teams, Steve Burke. Like, do I understand it? Yes. But do I have the fucking obnoxious audacity to think my fucking one opinion of not being interested in making passive income in real estate is right? No, I do not. This world is an and world. And every fucking person that thinks it's an or world will continue to fucking lose and cry and fucking leave hate because you're fucking sad because you think the world is limited when it's fucking not. So figure it the fuck out. The world is about and. The world is about more. And the more you put passion into leaving little snide comments or thinking you're right over a drink or it's a fad. You said fucking social was a fad, dick. You said TikTok was a fad, asshole. You said the internet was a fad. You said you'd never get a fucking iPhone because you love your fucking Blackberry. You fucking no mafia, this no mafia so many of you are, fucking sucks. It fucking sucks. I believe when you believe things are your fault, you feel like you're in control and you have the ability to fix it. I feel like when you point fingers, it's an incredibly sad place to be because you you feel helpless, which leads to a lot of levels of anxiety, depression, and unhappiness. I'm aware that not everything is my fault, yeah. but I can tell you at Vayner X, 1,500 people globally, I do believe everything is my fault because my brain goes to this place. Well, if, let me make up a fake, fake office. If the Sweden office is not going well, well, I hired Johan. Like, like every time there's a problem, I'm like, well, I hired somebody that got, like, you know, I really do believe that. I, I don't believe that I'm in charge of how everybody acts in every situation, but there is this beautiful, you know, symphony in my head of like, look, this is my song. Like, I am, I am, I am driving this car. Yeah. And, um, and so I love accountability. I'm very hot on accountability. When people hear accountability, an enormous amount of people convert it into beating themselves up. I stink. Right. I, accountability is a beautiful thing. Deciding that you're a loser and beating yourself up, judgment on oneself is a bad thing. There, there's such a fine nuance there, but this is something I'm trying to spend more time on and call out, which is why I'm doing it right now, yeah. which is, Being accountable doesn't mean booing yourself. The easiest thing in the world is to be cynical, pessimistic, and negative. It's why everyone's doing it on social. This is what I'm talking about. The hard thing is to be optimistic and kind and be the bigger person. It is dramatically harder. And even worse, most people that have it don't have time for everybody else that's negative and just live their merry way. And I'm trying to get other happy, abundant, kind people to take on the responsibility 
of taking the misunderstanding and judgment from the masses to deploy more, to bring more happiness. We live in a world where many people use fear and negativity as an offensive weapon, as an agenda, and very few that use optimism and kindness as a weapon to counter it. The ones of us who were lucky, which drives entrepreneurs crazy, but I know I'm lucky for the DNA I was given, the mother that raised me, the circumstances of not having much, which gave me ambition and tenacity. The ones of us that are lucky, that feel full, feel fed, feel set, don't need a thing from any of you. We have a responsibility to our fellow man and woman to communicate the things we see and I'm willing to deal with a lot of misunderstanding and judgment, which hurts, I'm a human being, including hustle porn. Yeah. That shit drives me up a wall. It is never, go read, crush it cover to cover. Go take 7 p.m. to, somebody said, fuck you, Gary, you said 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. I'm like, did you read the three pages before it? I said, if you hate your job, yeah. how lucky are you that the internet came along and you can build something on YouTube from 7 p.m. to 2 in the morning that maybe over time can get you to leave a job that has you deeply unhappy. Yeah. That's very different than work 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. to make cash, to buy a Lambo, to act cool. Yeah. That's very different. I believe that people use nice guys finish last and kindness gets you walked all over as pure excuses for other variables in the equation. This is why I frame the book as ingredients. I actually think a lot of people use the narrative of being nice as a manipulation tool to try to get somebody to do something they want. Most people who cry about getting taken advantage of actually had an agenda and they weren't being kind, they were trying to manipulate a situation I say it all the time, I've been on the receiving end. Gary, I wanna drive you from the airport to the, yes, but really what you wanna do is get my scarcest value prop, which is my time, and what's gonna actually happen in that car is you're gonna ask for advice, which I'm incredibly flattered by. (laughs) However, I use my transition from airport to hotel to FaceTime my kids. It's not that I wanna be mean, it's just I need a little bit of my own time. Then, in the occasional times you take someone up on something like that, they said they just want to drive you to the car. I just want to drive you to the hotel. If you're, if you, I haven't done this because I'm scared of this scenario, but if you then don't say yes, and you're like, hey, I just got to do my headphones, I got to do some work. Oh, <laughs> I was being a nice guy, drove Gary, Gary like, and I see it, I see, I see it. Yeah. I see it every single day. Being kind, is predicated on what the other person wants, not what you want to give. So when people say, well, I'm a nice guy, it's just not true. Now, what may be true is that, much like me, and I was very vulnerable in the book, I've been lucky that I've had the power, but I'm not confrontational. So maybe it's not your kindness, it's your inability to have conflict. It's your inability to be candorous that leads to you getting walked all over. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I believe the walked all over crew was trying to manipulate an outcome by giving something they wanted to give, not what the person that they were trying to get something from wanted. I really believe that. So like, one of the things that really works for me is respecting the audience more than my own opinion. So I think I'm about to build something so insane with me friends you can't imagine. Like I really think I'm about to build over the next 40 years. A, it's, you know, my ambition is Disney. It's so big that it's like, even I, and I shoot big, I'm like empathetic to why that feels like an audacious statement. But, but there is no doubt in my mind, my agenda is to build Pokemon, Disney, all that, right? But if Be Friends fails, it's because I wasn't good enough. I never think, like, I would never say that word worst And I think that's the part you have to play with. There's two things that I think you have to think about in your wrestling. One, spending one minute looking at somebody else's success and deciding the world is wrong about it is a losing formula. Yeah, for sure. Two, everything I do is for the doing of it, not for an outcome. Maybe maybe there was a gift there, but maybe there was a little bit of a curse in that CNN comment I gave to you eight years ago because I don't do anything with any expectation that it's gonna lead to anything. I do it because I wanna do that thing and I believe the breadcrumbs and the collateral from it will 
in fact create something, but not a specific thing. Yeah. The goal is a is a forever omni gray thing. Even the Jets thing. Talk about another thing that's misunderstood about my brand. I could give two fucks if I ever buy the Jets. Yeah, and everyone's probably rooting for you to fail. Like, oh, he'll never do it, look at. You know what's funny? I think the world's awesome. I think 85% of the people are actually cheering the shit out of me. It's just the 20 or 15% in that scenario that aren't are louder than the 85%. Maybe it's Patriot fans, who knows? Fair enough. But for me, I just want to try to buy the Jets. Yeah. Like, the game. Yeah. My game. It has always been about the process for you. I'm obsessed with the pro- like, upset. Even, you know, even being a little bit more on the personal level, which I don't share a lot, from fifth to like 10th grade, it's very clear to me in hindsight, I just wanted to get the girl that I liked to like me. I was even scared to even date. I was like a little scared of girls, right? Like I didn't, like I didn't want to go the next, like I was so, I had enough personality skills and I am who I am that I was able to win that game against odds a lot of times but then I feared the actual relationship. I was too focused on my sports cards. I matured late of like being ready for like sex and shit. So like it was the process that I liked. Can I get Stacy Johnson or Pam Moses to like me? Not will I then do something about it? Best advice. Number one, don't say no. The biggest reason people are gonna struggle with this opportunity is they decided it's not real. Conceptually. Yeah. Like this is a good idea, accept it. Be curious and live in and, and yes, instead of or and no. Curiosity and humility. Humility's powerful in moments like this. I'm busy, my time's busy. I, I'm gonna choose these other things instead of something that may or may not work out. I'm really trying to challenge myself on this curiosity thing because I'm also starting to realize how much humility is a part of it. And I'm starting to realize how much that is who I am. For everyone who's like, he predicts, he sees around corners, he's Nostradamus, it's all based on humility and curiosity. Let me explain real quick. Musically, I was so busy with Vayner. I didn't have time to look at, Musically was for 12 and 11 and 10 year old girls. Right but my curiosity and my humility that I can give up these 25 hours even though I can make more money over here, patience, long term, Queen's Gambit, led me to a place where I understood it well enough that when TikTok came, I was already on third and a half base while everybody else was like, what's TikTok or no way? And now TikTok, as we film this, is the establishment. It is taking market share from Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like, it is the establishment. And YouTube. That's right. Good stuff, Gary. Cheers. Thank you, guys.